Good day, everyone. My name is Ron Olasco from International Trade Council. Uh, thank you for attending uh, today's educational session. Before we start, um, I just want to make a quick audio check. If you guys can hear me, can you please type in yes in the chat box? And if you can also see the PowerPoint presentation. OK, perfect. Thank you. All right. Hi. All right. Perfect. Um, the audience can hear us and can see the PowerPoint presentation. Our educational session for today is how data interoperability and distributed governance can accelerate the fast lane. In this webinar, we'll explore how data interoperability enhance trade efficiency. We'll, we'll dive into regulatory changes, spotlight EFTI's impact on supply chains, and discuss creating a fast lane for smoother operations and we'll also cover data challenges and governance principle, focusing on real-world trade use cases. And finally, we'll relate these concepts to pharmaceutical supply chains and conclude with Q&A. If you have any questions on the duration of the presentation, please feel free to type in your questions on the Q&A tab or chat box, and our panelists will go in to answer the question after the presentation. Our speaker for today is our Thibaut Lecter, Senior Consultant Global Trade Advisory of the uh, Deloitte Belgium, Martin Hitman, Senior Manager of Define, Enrique Acosta, CEO, CEO of, and Principal Co-Founder of ES Information Systems Incorporated, Edward Edward Cole, CEO of Catalyst Technology Limited, and Dan Deviglier, Partner of Deloitte Belgium. So I will going to pass the um, floor now to our panelists. Go ahead, sir. Yes, thanks a lot, Ron. So, uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. Pleased to uh, meet you virtually all. If we take a look at the overview of the webinar, I will start first with the regulatory setting and some practical insights of pilot projects that we have performed. Next, uh, Enrique will talk about how to gather, process, and use the data that matters in an international trade context. Uh, thirdly, Edward will talk about distributed governance principles that he believes and we believe define and will define the future of data management. Martin will talk about yeah, the, the practical insights uh, of pharma supply chain, so a very practical part. And at the end, we will have uh, a closing speech. So let's kick off um, on the regulatory setting and some practical insights. So uh, my part will first talk about the FT regulation, which is the Electronic Freight Transport Information Regulation. It's a very important regulation that has been published by the European Commission and that will come into force uh, mid-2024. Um, it will have profound impacts on everyone who is involved in transport and logistics. Secondly, we will talk about the Gateway to Britain projects. So we have done some practical, uh, real pilot shipments uh, and, and the Gateway to Britain project is in general a project to boost the trade between the EU and the UK post-Brexit. And then thirdly, um, we will introduce the concept of a fast lane, uh, which is in, in general an optimization of the supply chain, uh, because uh, establishing a fast lane would mean a faster import clearance. But first things first, let's talk about the rules, the, the legislation. Uh, at the beginning of the FT regulation, you will read in the text that efficiency of freight transport and logistics is vital for the growth and competitiveness of the union economy. That's a very bold statement and a true statement made by the European Commission because the goal or one of the goals of the FT regulation is to reduce the administrative burden and the corresponding administrative costs. As you all know, um, a big part of international trade and transport requires documents, bill of lading, airway bill uh, and so on. And the goal is to reduce this administrative burden by making it digital. And that brings me to the next step. So the EU, the Commission wants to encourage digitalization of the freight transport process. Um, if you use track and trace devices, breach detection devices, monitoring devices, these devices um, create data, create information that can be sent towards the systems of the authorities. Brings me to the third part. So the improvements of the enforcement capabilities of authorities. We're talking about customs authorities, police authorities, port authorities. Um, if these authorities gather the data on the transport and the freight, um, they are able to perform their job better because it's, of course, uh, part of their job to ensure the safety um, of the, the, the global trade. Uh, 
and um, yeah, make sure that everything f flows smoothly, so the facilitation of trade. You will also increase the transport efficiency and the transport um, information exchange processes. And last but not least, uh, if you remove the use of paper and make sure that all these processes run digitally, yeah, then you enhance also the sustainability aspect. And as you all know, sustainability uh, is key these days and will be even more important um, in the future. So quick at the highlights, not diving into the uh, details of the regulation, but the regulation says, okay, we will make a one-stop shop for harmonized data exchange. So you have the track and trace yeah, or the, the monitoring devices and you will have their platforms. The goal uh, of the commission is to specify uh, the technical requirements of the track and trace devices and also the platforms that are used right by doing so they will they, they need to enhance interoperability of course because currently lots of players within the supply chain already use certain technology of software think about a transport management system uh, a global trade system and so on so you need to make sure that the use of these devices and the data that is exchanged is interoperable with current systems you also have to make it a uniform application of acceptance because, as you know, the EU, we have 27 member states. You have different authorities of the member states, but you need to make sure that the, the transfer of the data happens in a standardized way, in a uniform way. Secondly, so I mentioned you have the FT platforms, we call it in the regulation, and the FT service providers. Um, when making use of a platform, there need to be several functional requirements. So you need to make sure when you want to sell an FT platform to uh, clients um, in the union that, um, that there is confidentiality and confidentiality can be guaranteed. Because if that's not possible, your FT platform will never be approved by uh, assessment bodies. There needs to be confidentiality. There also needs to be operational logs. Um, the technology has to be able to check from beginning till end, what has happened? What data have been um, created, transferred, exchanged? And then a very important parameter is, of course, it needs to be GDPR proof. And that's also closely linked to uh, the confidentiality. You need to make sure if you have an FT platform um, that some players can access certain types of information, but that these users are shielded from other types of information, right? So that needs to be very clear. There will not be one track and trace service provider within the uh, entire union. That's, of course, uh, impossible. There will be multiple. And what do the governments need to do if there are multiple? They need to say, OK, if you meet these criteria, we will approve your FT te technology, your FT platform. And the audit yeah, is done by several uh, assessment bodies, uh, which have been delegated several powers. So these assessment bodies, the auditors, let's say, will check cert certain criteria. Do the FT platforms meet these criteria? Yes, OK, you get approved. And your track and trace device and your correspond corresponding platform can be uh, used within the union. Making it a bit more practical. So um, I want to introduce you to the Gateway to Britain project that we uh, have been doing and are still doing um, together with our partners, um, Institute for Logistics, Sports. Um, the, the concept lies on three pillars. So in general, um, we want to enhance the data sharing between the partners in the supply chain. Think about terminal operator, forwarder, transporter, exporter, authorities. Um, not only data, but also trade documents, customs messages. And if you would do so, you would enhance the, the transparency of the border formality process end-to-end. -end. Yeah, so we're not only looking at the EU export or import process, but also the UK export and import process to make sure that the data sharing happens between all partners of the supply chain end-to-end. -end. So from the moment the goods depart until they arrive. The second pillar is to create a physical service point. And post-Brexit, there were big troubles for SMEs who did not have the trade departments, customs departments. Uh, what we want to do is create a one-stop shop the entry point um, towards the transparent trade lane. Um, 
by making sure that exporters, so SME exporters, uh, go to a certified service point, give the goods to the service point, and the service point takes care of all the rest, meaning the transport, the border formalities, uh, bringing the goods to the end client. So all logistic services would be centralized in these certified physical service points. The third pillar, and that's the most important pillar for today, is to create a transparent trade lane. If you would equip your containers, your trailers, with track and trace devices, with breach detection devices, and so on, you are able to track the flow end to end. So you would be able to know at every moment, where are my goods? Did they pass a certain geofence? Uh, yes or no? Uh, is there any trouble? You could monitor that, and you would have the transparency. Uh, again, pillar one would have the transparency that is required um, to ensure an efficient supply chain. So how would this transparent trade lane look like? You see a supply chain from sender to receiver. In between, you, you may have the service points, and that's our dream. And you also have the partners in the supply chain, terminal operators, shipping line, customs, and so on. Well, if you would install a device at the sender's location, um, the data could be exchanged with the platform, so the FT platform, which typically lies or, or makes use of Internet of Things technology. And all partners who have access to that platform can check the location of the goods at any time. Hence, you would create a transparent trade lane. That platform of the track and trace device can exchange, of course, information with other digital platforms, which would, in our case, be the Gateway to Britain data sharing platform. Uh, but other platforms uh, are possible as well. We conducted some pilots uh, at the beginning uh, of 2023, uh, 10 weeks long, where we simulated uh, real uh, shipments, one or two trucks or containers per week. And these trucks and containers were equipped with several devices. So we had four uh, providers of track and trace technology. We, as uh, within Deloitte and Flemish Institute for Logistics, coordinated these pilots, and we have as mentioned, four technology providers, and I want to zoom in uh, with you and uh, the audience on the fourth one, which is CSD, so a container security device and a track and trace device, uh, which had very, very interesting capabilities. Uh, you see the capabilities, the status of the seal. It was able to monitor whether a door was breached. It was able to reflect the location, whether there was an inspection. It monitored the light conditions, temperature conditions, and so on. And that is the iSeal device um, on which we want to bring your attention. So the ICL device, which you see on this slide, um, has several uh, important benefits. First of all, you have an increased efficiency, though, so the, the establishment of a fast lane. I will talk about that next slide. Uh, but the general concept is that if you um, use this device in your container at the sender's location and you insert it um, inside the container, that's an important feature. The container is transported towards uh, a third country. Well, upon entry in that third country, if the customs authorities would see, okay, uh, the ICL device says that there has been no tampering with the container, no breach, then you could say, okay, let's take the container from the terminal and you would speed up the import clearance process and the transport process from the terminal. If you would do so, if authorities would use this device, you would facilitate legitimate traders. Trustful traders, they can be given access to the fast lane, whereas illegitimate traders uh, will not have access to that fast lane and they will have a check, uh, most probably upon uh, import. You would prevent theft and you would be able to detect theft and where it happens. So for what container did it happen? Where did it happen? At what time did it happen? Uh, and the authorities will be able to use this information to act upon that. You increase your trust, and so that's that's a very important part. Enrique will talk about that um, further. And the customs authorities specifically could enhance the efficiency and the effectivity of their controls. As you may know, um, there is also a problem of revenue management. Not all import duties, excises, and import VAT are always claimed by the authorities. So if you would use this device, you would be able to detect uh, fraud um, in paying your, your tax upon import. And it creates visibility and transparency, of course, throughout the entire supply chain. 
introducing you all to the fast lane concept. So what would it mean? Upon the sender's location, you fill your container with goods, you take an eye seal device, you insert it inside the container, and you close the doors. The goods depart, they start in the supply chain moving to the different steps. Eventually, they arrive at the receiver's location in the third country. It's a non-intrusive device, and the customs authorities at the third country could see, OK, uh, there is no tampering with the container. We will release the container upon submission of the import declaration, and the container can be removed from terminal. You make a separation, legitimate versus illegitimate traders, and it has a big economical advantage because you would skip days or even weeks of port congestion. Port congestion is a very burning problem uh, in ports nowadays. Um, so that would also tackle this problem. It's not the only problem that's being tackled. If you would use this fast lane concept, there are advantages for the shipper, for the transporter, for the forwarder, the terminal operator. Uh, Enrique will talk about the, the big advantages it has for the shipper. Uh, amongst which brand protection and reputation is an important one. But I will zoom in quickly on the role of customs, eh, which is here in Italics. Uh, it has a higher efficiency, so the customs authorities um, would be able to target specific containers to check, um, which is very important in their job package to make sure that they facilitate legitimate traders. They secure the borders in a better way, and by extracting data uh, to their systems, uh, they increase the visibility and they're able to act. Also for the government uh, on the top right corner, um, it adds to security. Uh, and, um, if you have uh, security problems in the country, it, it can be because of drugs, it can be because of contraband and so on. There's a lot of crime involved with that. Uh, so you could tackle that as well and you would increase your revenue management. So collect all the taxes that are due. Not only public players have an advantage, also private players such as insurance companies who can do better risk assessments, uh, process claims better, and they know where the crime um, happened and so on, and increase of profitability. Now I will give with pleasure the word to Enrique who will uh, guide you a bit further in uh, the ICL device and the data that it uses. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Uh, my name is Enrique Acosta. I'm the CEO and founder of ICEAL. Um, the ICEAL is a breach detection platform for maritime shipping containers. Um, Thibaut, if we could uh, do slide 14, please. Yes. Thank you very much. The concept of ICEAL goes beyond track and trace. The emphasis is on breach detection basically maintaining uh, sovereignty and custody over the container and the, throughout the chain of custody. Um, we provide for an onboard suite of sensors that include individual door monitoring, geolocation with geofencing, light detection, and environmental parameters, all from inside the container and independently direct from the conveyance. We monitor the voyages from the time the containers are loaded at the origin point through the entire uh, voyage. Our batteries last 180 days, and we have excuse me, communications capabilities in 192 countries. So we really are worldwide. Um, next slide, please. Going back to the focus on breach detection, uh, it's very important to note that anything external in a shipping container may be breached, may be accessed, and it could be easily defeated. The eye seal is completely inside the container and is not dependent on any external components such as an antenna or even line of sight. Um, the evidence that we provide in terms of breach reports, trip reports, are all based on GSM cell technology. 5G and LTE, which is forensically verifiable by law enforcement and authorities. Um, we operate on secure servers that have military grade encryptions, and we deliver this data privately through APNs, and these can be delivered to any of the stakeholders in the supply chain, including law enforcement, customs, and the commercial operatives of, of any uh, uh, operation. Next slide, please. we can provide a daily and a hourly report of the custody of a container for the entire 180 days that I have mentioned that the battery life 
uh, comprised of. This report will indicate the individual serial numbers of the units, the individual serial numbers of the towers with which we are speaking with. This is accompanied by the radius reports. And each data point will include information about the door position, the light values, the internal environmental parameters inside the container. And again, all independently coming from the conveyance directly, not from a shipping company, not from a third party uh, interest, independent from the conveyance. Next slide, please. This detailed slide provides you an idea and our colleagues from Catalyst will be able to expand on the fact that this data must be A, verifiable, but B, it must be handled in a very discreet and compartmentalized way to ensure that everybody in the, in the uh, chain of custody has access to this data when and if they are properly authorized. So the ICL right now is working on our independent servers. However, we can deliver this data directly to sovereigns, terminal operators, shipping lines, or law enforcement uh, directly. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a handoff towards Edward. I would like to conclude with saying that uh, ICL had the privilege last week of attending the World Customs Organization Conference in Hanoi. Um, the, the theme of the conference was technology and basically embracing the digital age, leveraging technology, fostering innovation, and nurturing the next generation of customs professionals. This conference was attended by 95 sovereign customs authorities with 1,200 uh, participants. The message of today's uh, webinar is very much in line with what the World Customs Organization is looking to promote. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and I pass it off to my colleague, Edward. Thank you very much, Enrique. So <clears throat> Catalyst Technologies here to provide the distributed governance principles that are going to define the future of uh, data management in this type of environment. But needed to meet the shifting paradigms in freight and logistics data management is the underpinning technology to support such Web3 approaches, so-called trustless systems, whereby, if we could have the next slide, please. Yeah. Where we have uh, decentralized infrastructure connects everyone and everything, each with a smart wallet, to orchestrate their intentions in a digital twin ecosystem. Each wallet armed with configurable algorithms for process automation. Verifiable credentials are issued to the res respective actors, digital wallets, such that authenticity can now be confirmed without the need to contact the issuer directly. A test case application was originally designed for managing the cardiovascular patient journey in a health context and was recognized by the International Trade Council as the winner of the Go Global Award in 2022 for its potential for adoption in the freight and logistics supply chain, hence its relevance here. Uh, further recognition for such an approach has come from the UK Innovate for Security by Design and as a tr transformative technology for future telecoms and enabling data uh, to being managed with low energy use and poor connectivity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, verifiable credentials underpin the five key principles of the logistics wallet system. Sensitive data must not be stored on a blockchain. Private data must be stored under the control of the data owner. The architecture must be designed to enhance privacy and security to quantum resistant standards that allow for secure data handling and ensure sensitive data does not leave jurisdictions without consent and that data may be deleted at the discretion of the owner. For universal interoperability, a platform agnostic approach is necessary to ensure compa compatibility with existing infrastructures and standard interfaces are needed for seamless integration. For genuine scalability, the wallets must be hosted, whether either local or cloud computation power may be employed. It must be fit for the purpose in coordinating billions of nodes and must show efficient allocation that boosts data availability in the network. For incremental extensibility, a data agnostic approach must conform with the diversity of data, from metadata to tabular and unstructured data, 
on a modular platform enabled such that further capabilities may be added. Fundamental to adoption is for all the stakeholders to be empowered under the appropriate regulation to deploy roll-to-roll -roll protocols to twin their real-world relationships in an ecosystem that allows users to act on their own best interests. Thank you, Thibaut. Next slide, please. I recommend a building block approach for incremental transformation from silos to an interconnected network, starting with the cargo owner, now equipped with a user app that represents the starting point, if you will, allowing users to register the cargo and self-certify forms with additional interfaces for algorithmic users and third-party providers, such as data analytics and diagnostic systems. Next, the cargo tractor the cargo tracker monitors environmental data collected from the container and metadata, including standardized timestamps, with exchanges and transmission of data, respecting both the limitations in connectivity and protecting the confidentiality of business data. The port authority can now be in included, armed with the roll-to-roll -roll protocols that allow for consent of data sharing between the cargo tracker and the port authority. This data exchange on the trust graph is what facilitates the fast lane access, automating inspection by exception only, thus reducing delays and speeding traffic. The freight company now has data available for autonomous research and the transfer of data from one vehicle to another with smart contracts, twinning real world legal contracts for when ownership is changed. Finally, all stakeholders are rewarded by including insurance in this trust graph providing the transparency of high cost goods through the fast lane by access, through fast lane by access to tracker data and automation of insurance coverage by means of roll to roll protocols with freight companies and cargo owners. In summary, the new paradigm for freight and logistics is a distributed network that enables stakeholders to collect and store credentials such as diplomas, licenses or identity documents in a digital wallet under their control, which when needed, they can selectively share these credentials with verifiers, reducing the need to disclose unnecessary business information. Next slide, please, Tibo. Thank you. So what does all this mean in the real world? Um, I pass you over to Martin Heitman of Define, who will share with you his insights with the example of the critical, uh, the critical importance of uh, uh, logistics and uh, data management in the pharma supply chains. Over to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Edward. And uh, thank you also for the opportunity to speak here at the ITC. So it's really my pleasure to connect the dots between we've, what we've seen in the first part of this talk, starting with the upcoming regulation and the Gateway to Britain project, then how data can be uh, generated and used for the purpose of the fast lane and these principles. For use case, that is very close to our all heart because sometimes we all might be patients, patients in need of uh, pharmaceuticals, um, a particular treatment where we don't want to lack the suppliers uh, in this particular market. Now, connecting uh, the various areas from commercials to safety, let's uh, dive into the topic by this overview of a really huge market accruing to 450 billion roughly in global trade in 2022, where we see large established players from Europe, like Germany, which is uh, my home place, Switzerland, of course, UK as well, and US being one further global player. But then there are emerging players as well. As you can see, India over there with about 18 billion US dollars in export in pharmaceuticals, really showing the commercial effects this, this particular vertical in trade has um, now coming to the, to the implications this has for patients. While the market is huge on a global level, let's take a look at a, a, little, uh, a little bit um, um, f um, f further perspective down in the, in the details of how a particular um, freight uh, case could look like. Where an aircraft, um, when we all remember the COVID times um, that we were in, could hold as, uh, pharmaceuticals in value of 200 million US dollars. So really one cargo aircraft with 18 containers 
and 1.75 million doses that could be administered to the patients in the end. And this shows us the two-phase nature of this market. The one is the commercial relevance of um, highly high-cost, high expansive freight that we are seeing here, but also the implications. So imagine that such freight would be lost in the middle of the pandemic, that we we are um, face a drawback in terms of our fight against against the virus. While on the other hand, it's very important to meet quality standards, quality standards that are up to ensure uh, product quality and ultimately patient safety. Where, for instance, here, cold chaining is quite important, where these, um, these vaccines have to be stored at minus 60 to minus 80 degrees all throughout the pharma supply chains. We will explore how, um, um, how complex these supply chains can be, uh, so to imagine um, how, what it takes to maintain these conditions. But clearly, we see here a high value at risks in this double nature of um, patients' well-being, but then also commercial value. Speaking about patient well-being, and then next slide, please. Coming to the regulation here in particular on what's important to ensure the safety of these pharmaceuticals. Where we've picked the example of the European Medicines Agency with the good distribution practices published and then an expert of, except of four paragraphs that are key here to our story. With a quality system that has to be in place, uh, ensuring that the standards of the, of the good distribution practices all in all are met, which comes to quality objectives, which comes to risk management, including, in fact, the supply chain risk management um, of what we are in control of, but then also um, on the delivery of goods, uh, of, of raw materials that we require for serving the markets. But the next paragraph, that where um, temperature and environmental control is very important indeed, um, think about the cold chain, but then also other parameters that could be collected with devices such as the ICL, like light, humidity, as, as some of these pharmaceuticals are very sensitive to these environmental conditions. So therefore, control and uh, traceability of this data is very important to meet regulatory standards and to ensure quality objectives. Coming to the point of counterband, perhaps, of falsified medicines, where operations have to ensure that the identity of the medicinal products are not lost and um, then and this comes to anti-tempering devices on the packaging or then from a wider perspective uh, also applying the uh, container security devices as we've seen earlier. Now when it comes to dissemination of information, picking the last paragraph here, falsified medical products, the point in time they were identified must be notified to the, um, the, to the uh, competent authorities, so to take action and to identify the root cause this has on the supply chain, where, of course, um, a, such a device, as we've seen, can, um, uh, can make us move faster in this communication and identifying what's going on. Next slide, please. Now, if we, look, if we take a look at the complexity of pharma supply chains, uh, matching this with all the operations that have to uh, be met um, in terms of the usual uh, trade and uh, customs uh, control. Um, let's let's have a look at the various stakeholders, various parties that are um, collaborating in these in these supply chains here. Starting really with the raw materials, the APIs, uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients that might be uh, produced by some stakeholders over there coming to the manufacturer who is then the license to actually uh, manufacture the, uh, the, um, the pharmaceutical up to the regulatory standards. Let's say a wholesaler would pick up these pharmaceuticals for distribution among pharmacies to be then delivered, in fact, to the patients, where authorities would govern, as we've seen by the good distribution practices, for instance, this whole process. These are quite some stakeholders, but things can get more complex in balancing commercial and quality interest in this all. Next click, please. We picked the example of parallel import techniques, which are getting more interesting as well, starting pretty much with a similar point of raw materials, um, many of which might exist, to then be manufactured at a particular plant for a particular country. However, there are instances where there are shortages in some countries that could be met by shifting stock, shifting goods from, from another country, where a wholesaler may decide to um, engage in parallel import, then for repackaging um, 
affect the pharmaceuticals, relabeling them for the new target markets, meeting those regulatory standards and information that must be provided, for then employ further logistics providers that would then ship this over to, to the actual target market, perhaps another wholesaler involved that is then the linking piece to in his distribution network to hospitals, pharmacies, and then the patients. So what we see here are just, is just a sketch of how complex such pharma supply chains could grow. And thereby, it's quite obvious that these supply chains are quite prone to disruptions, to shortages, and therefore have to, have to be controlled quite thoroughly for the sake of patients' well-being and product quality all in all, but also the commercial viability um, and efficiency uh, that's, um, that is behind all these, uh, these stakeholders uh, striving for the efficiency they require to survive on the markets. Next slide, please. Well, speaking about disruptions, shortages, in fact, where shortage is defined, where supply does not meet market demand at a national level, which in our case for pharmaceuticals means that patients in need of a particular treatment wouldn't get the treatment they require, or at least not the optimal treatment, if they are, if they are lucky enough to have choices of uh, pharmaceuticals they, that may help in their situation. And these shortages, more than 20 actually currently reported, reported by the EMA, uh, range from vaccination, as we've uh, seen this example before, um, antibiotics as uh, um, a very typical um, uh, everyday purpose pharmaceuticals to then the very costly and very uh, complex uh, care of, uh, of cancer drugs. Picking here two examples, say for meningococci, which is for vaccination of in particular uh, children um, um, against this um, awful disease, which can um, affect their, their lifetime if not vaccinated. On the other hand, um, still um, amoxicillin um, in an ongoing shortage as a uh, antibiotics that can serve a range of pharmaceutical infections where we are facing other uh, key risks and um, other uh, considerations as well in the uprise of resistances against uh, antibiotics, for instance, where this has wider impacts than just the shortage, even if other antibiotics might be available. And these implications for patients, of course, are, are real. These are quite, uh, quite troublesome. So let's think about what we can do about this. Next slide, please. In fact, once again, here, as per example, the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, has formed just this year, seeing these shortages, a plan uh, to prevent um, and uh, to prevent shortages and to improve supply chain resilience with the good practices, as we've seen here, as we are seeing here in this overview, where many of them are in fact linked to the availability of data, to the communication um, across various stakeholders, as we see, for instance, um, in item number two, to increase the transparency relating to shortage information. So this means that we require uh, adequate and accurate data in terms of how long might the shortage uh, last? What can we do about this shortage? What is the root cause? Um, so clarifying these questions to inform other stakeholders in the market, which we see, for example, in number eight, improved communication between stakeholders, which might be sensitive information that needs to be shared. Getting to the operations and uh, management of potentially shortages, where a prevention plan and shortage management plan need to, need to be established, as we see in items number four and five. So how would you act uh, on such plans for prevention or management if you don't have transparency on your supply chains, on the uh, individual goods, on the containers? So therefore, the effective execution of these plans requires high quality, uh, traceable data to the principles that we've seen earlier. Now coming to the next item of what to do with this data in terms of quality management acting on any incident that might be identified and taking care of vulnerabilities in the risk um, management approach as we see in items number six and seven that's, um, that can help improving in a continuous manner um, the overall supply chain as to these disruptions. Coming to our last item balancing carefully the risk that may arise from complex um, parallel trade or export um, uh, activities 
which may be for the commercial uh, benefit, which may be for the benefits of patients in another country, but then possibly causing shortages all as well in the original country. So therefore, this balance and informed decision making requires high quality data as well to then um, find the best way forward that serves various needs. So clearly, we see that the European Medicines Agency has this on their on their mind when it comes to the future of how healthcare services should be provided, pharmaceuticals should be distributed in the markets. And we see this also as a, as a lighthouse to other initiatives that we are seeing, for example, as the ISPE, the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineering, has published um, um, as well a plan to tackle uh, supply chain shortages on a global level. Next slide, please. Now let's connect the dots between how, how high quality data, verifiable data can help in the situation in fact. First one, to ensure the product quality and to protect patient sa safety. So the data that was collected by these tracker devices verified on the trust graph can then demonstrate that conditions as required for these pharmaceuticals like cold chaining are met. Then for number, item number two, uh, the law for early action to fight counterfeit drugs, where this traceability from credit to patient can be ensure that the right pharmaceuticals were delivered to the right party, so no tampering has been involved. And, and on top of the uh, mechanisms that we see on the packages um, all across the pharma supply chain. Demonstrate compliance with GDP so that corporations can be assured that they are meeting the standards and the practices, proving this, in fact, based on verifiable data to inspectors and thereby looking in confidence to inspections as to GDP principles and practices. Getting to um, more elaborate items like improving the cross-border import operations where, um, where um, the um, uh, where the efficiency in operations rarely is the true cause of a shortage of pharmaceuticals in a particular market, but in fact could improve uh, could um, could improve a lot the um, counteraction against shortages if then pharmaceuticals would be available all as well to get them quickly as possible to those patients in need. And in the end, as we as we've explored on the last slide, boosting supply chain resilience by management of data, applying modeling, and then risk management techniques, so that we are well aware of what's going on. As we've put it here in a control tower perspective, to manage these supply chains and um, foster communication transparency across various stakeholders. Now, with this story that shows that there is always a balance to be met between commercials and then here, in fact, um, the, the people affected, patients, this is something that should be of, imp of importance to all of us. And therefore, I'm looking very much forward to how these uh, various regulations actually been, being applied, taken to action to, to improve the situation in healthcare. Handing over now to next slide, please, to the closing speech, which will be delivered by Deloitte. Yes, thanks a lot, Martin. So uh, thank you all for your attention. So final word of closing. Uh, I think we have a dream, uh, all speakers within this webinar, and this dream is the fast lane. Eh? And to create the fast lane, there are, of course, the important building blocks, eh, as has be, have been mentioned, proper data, because data is the new gold, uh, technology, uh, technology. we believe this is also the future and it has shaped our uh, societies in the past and it will continue shaping our societies uh, in the future. The fast lane as a concept itself is also some type of gold, we believe, because um, the fast lane has advantages for all stakeholders within the supply chain, whether it's private, uh, so exporter, importer, who will receive the goods faster, uh, a shipping line, uh, a terminal operator, uh, insurance companies, but also the public side, the government in itself. If you are able to combat fraud, if you're able to combat crime, contraband, drugs, narcotics, trafficking, these are huge, huge advantages um, that that are yeah, that can only happen or are enhanced by the use of a fast lane. As you all move, as you all know. Goods that are not moving within a supply chain, if they are standing still, they are not creating value. And we hope and we dream uh, that one day uh, with the use of devices, such as the device of ICEAL and the building blocks 
that have been presented by Martin uh, and by Edward, uh, that this dream may come true. Eh? Just so you know, uh, the current ID of Europe, the European Commission, as far as I know, is that no goods will enter the European Union as from 2029 that do not have trackers or uh, breach detection devices or security devices and so on. So it will not be a matter of being cool or being uh, uh, an early adopter. It will, in the end, be obliged uh, to enhance the safety and the security to facilitate trade and to make uh, the society and the logistics community as a whole uh, better. So thanks a lot for yeah, your attention and following this webinar. If there are any questions, uh, you can put them in the chat and we will answer them with pleasure. Thank you. All right, thank you for that uh, very informative presentation, everyone. Um, we're open for questions now. If you have any questions, just please feel free to type in your questions on the comment section or um, like any tab of this uh, platform. While we are waiting for questions, just a few reminders from ITC. So this webinar is recorded and uh, we will going to uh, post this webinar to our YouTube channel. So you can actually um, re replay that in that uh, website. And you can also replay this um, in Aramid. Just log in and look for this um, for this uh, recording. Also, if anyone on the group that is not yet a member of International Trade Council, um, we will be going to give a free membership. Just send me an email. And lastly, you will be receiving a certificate of participation for this webinar in the next seven days. All right, so, okay, there is one question here. I'll, I'll show in the stage. Can you guys see it? Yes. Yes, a uh, question from Alejandro. Yep, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the question, Alejandro. Um, yes, we're open to speak with you about Estonia and any of the other participants. Um, we will have our emails and contact information uh, readily shared. And yes, be a pleasure to speak with you. Okay, perfect. Any other questions? You can actually um, type in your email address here on the chat box. So if anyone would like to reach out to you directly, um, they can um, they can definitely get your email address here. All right. So if you have any questions to the panelists, um, please feel free to type in your questions here. I mean, uh, to email them directly, they have their email address. So while we are waiting for questions, as we still have more time, uh, feel free to, um, to discuss uh, what you would like to uh, inform to the audience while we are waiting for the question. Anyone can... Um, can discuss. Um, I'll take the opportunity. Um, what I'd like to expand on Gateway to Britain and the topics that Thibaut uh, discussed and how ICEAL participated in that. Um, we were selected amongst a group of technology and service providers for this purpose, for this uh, proof of concept. And what we did is we deployed ICEALs in shipping containers that were originating in Zeebrugge, Port Antwerp, and we're transiting between the UK and uh, Belgium repeatedly over a 90 day period. And what was being monitored were the locations of authorized and unauthorized uh, breaches. Um, the idea was to monitor the trade and tax compliance post Brexit. So that is that speaks to one of the economic value props. Um, Another value prop that Thibaut uh, touched upon was security. Um, we just conducted a uh, workshop on September 7 um, with the Port of Antwerp and the Ministry of Justice and Finance of Belgium uh, to dis deploy ICEALs in containers. Um, and, and so uh, th that workshop is available, uh, news about it on online. So please feel free to, to take a look at some of the projects where ICEAL has been deployed in real world cases. So I'll, I'll defer. Thank you. Maybe one, one question from my side as you were referring to the Gateway to Britain project. So do you have some estimates from there of how much we can drive down the waiting times, as Thibault was also uh, referring to goods that are standing still, do not carry any value. So in terms of the efficiency potential 
that you can actually see that can be lifted by this technology. Yeah, so maybe I mean, one interesting part eh, of, of the pilots of Gateway to Britain, we had a flow, uh, as Enrique mentioned, from Port of Zeebrugge uh, to the Port of Hull, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and the container was there several days because it had not been cleared by customs. Imagine you would not have this innovative technology uh, to tell you, okay, this is still the location. Uh, so imagine before these pilots uh, and without the technology, this happens, you will get a phone from your clients at the UK who will say, yeah, where are my goods? And you as an exporter who sold the goods, you're not aware. So this is really take also about taking ownership of your supply chain, mm -hmm. knowing what problems that arise. And you, you, of course, the forwarder is a, is a very important player uh, within the system, and you should always trust your forwarder. But trust is not always good enough. Control is sometimes better. Mm -hmm. And if you see, okay, my um, goods are stuck in the port several days, and they do not exit this geofence zone, um, or there has been a breach, yeah. Yeah, then, then you should act as well as exporter. Mm -hmm. So making the supply chain faster, uh, taking ownership, that's also what this is uh, mm -hmm. all about. Yeah. So seeing um, this again from the pharma supply chain perspective, where many pharmaceuticals have quite a short expiry, where every day actually counts for the distribution and then, then serving patients uh, with the economic value that we've seen on top of the sustainability consideration in a cold chain case where it just takes a lot of energy to maintain these conditions on in uh, on top of what we what we see as effects on the patients. So here, also from this uh, humanitarian um, perspective of how we can serve patients best, I think this improvement in efficiency really has the potential to uh, to 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 make an impact in what matters. Enrique, sorry, you also want no, to chat. I wanted to expand on something that Thibaut said about Gateway. We saw transit times on the ship of maybe three to five days maximum, but yet we saw cargo sitting for seven to 10 days on each side waiting for paper customs. So basically four, four times uh, the number of days at land trying to clear um, as opposed to those at sea. Um, Thibault also mentioned, uh, and Martin, you mentioned data from a third party source. Uh, yes, freight forwarders are key. We call them 3PLs, third-party logistics providers. Uh, they are key, but you must consider the source of the information. Um, many of these sources are grabbing data from shipping lines, from courier systems. And something that's interesting about the ICL and this concept is that this data is independent and it's coming directly from the conveyance. Uh, so mm -hmm. when Thibaut talks about control, it's the stakeholders that are the actual beneficial cargo owners, uh, port authorities to actually have visibility through data. And, and that's the control. So uh, thanks, Martin. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. I think that um, all their questions have been answered by the presentation. So um, we'll just spend a few minutes. Um, if you have any other things you would like to inform them, um, we can wrap up and then we can end the, we can end the presentation. Well, just reach out to everybody. Everybody who's got an interest in the innovative technology that is distributed governance, they want to understand a little bit more about what decentralized uh, infrastructures actually truly look like how smart wallets work, how they're informed with roll-to-roll -roll protocols, which enable this uh, automation, if you will, and uh, across a trust graph, and all these various other features and capabilities, which I think are gonna provide the type of interoperability. When I say interoperability, I mean uh, the data exchange, if you will, uh, with consent across siloed systems, big systems, uh, giving that individual cargo owner much more control and the ability to plan for their data. In all these type of um, capabilities, 
uh, we'd be very happy at Catalyst to explore with you and to perhaps uh, engage in uh, in understanding a little bit more clearly uh, about uh, how you, how your business can benefit from these types of uh, technologies and why we see these technologies being very important uh, to uh, interactive systems across both health and uh, freight and logistics into the future. Yeah, I have one question this. here. Yeah, there's a question uh, from Jean-Marc. So uh, uh, I can... It, uh, yeah, Tito, if if I may, because this is very yeah. interesting. We just we just had an actual uh, calculation during a conversation in Vietnam last yeah. week. We were speaking with a maritime operator that is doing transit in the Vietnam waterways, and we asked them for real world numbers on numbers of days or numbers of containers which would be increased or decreased by the use of the digital technology. And the gentleman postulated the following numbers. With the current delays, or let's just say with the current system, he could probably move 5,000 containers per week. If he had just a 35% expedite on the custom side, he could easily move upward of 6,250 containers. So the bottom line for the shipping and transportation company in terms of efficiency was undeniable. And I believe customs authorities, like I said at the beginning of the presentation, are as interested in governance as much as they are throughput. They have a mandate to promote trade. So these technologies facilitate trade. And again, it's a, it's a plus for all the, share, share, uh, the stakeholders in the value chain. So Thibaut, back to you. Yeah. Yes, I fully agree. So um, if you take a look at the customs controls on exports, it's very limited. It's, of course, a secret number, and it differs for every customs authority. But for safety reasons, let's say for export, you have 2% checks either on export or at the customs office of exit. So 2% is not that much. Why do they do less checks on export? That's, of course, OK, the goods are leaving. So it's not really our problem anymore at the customs office of export. Of course, for some goods that are of strategic interests to the, the union uh, or, or the community yeah, they will need to check is there an e export license um, and so on but we're talking here at uh, the fast lane concept is about import and checks for imports are much 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 higher there is even for some type of goods a hundred percent check rates think about uh russia think about other sensitive countries but not only geopolitical, also the type of goods. So for foods, I hear, uh, Edwards, sometimes from um, the food authorities in the UK, that these percentages go to nearly hundreds. Uh, so if there is veterinary products, uh, they need to check it and they, they need to make sure that there is no harm that can be done by these products on the community. So imagine that you would have 10% check on imports I mean, the, the real at, at the border inspection post, a physical check opening your container and so on. Well, if the device could prove that the goods um, were safe during the transport, so the, the device of ICU, for instance, shows no breach, shows that the temperature has been constant, and eh? pharmaceuticals, as, as Martin mentioned, so at minus 60, minus 70 degrees, temperature was constant. Yeah, when the goods arrive as customs authority, you could say fast clearance, fast lane, because they have not been tampered with, temperature has been equal, uh, and if the data can be trusted, and that then, of course, bringing us to the discussion of data management, data governance, then you can pass. And I think the, the benefits, both in, in operational time, uh, in, in, in also yeah, not lost value, um, reaching your, your expected time of arrival at the customer, that's a great benefit, again, for the entire logistical chain. Yeah. Thank you. So, though to actually realize this, I think we, we've witnessed now that this, is, this, this requires a collaborative approach where many items have to be fit together in this, in this jigsaw puzzle that we are solving here from the technology side, from the governance side, but then also from, from the perspective of data. So, this maybe serving as a closing word, as Ron was also um, was uh, already uh, starting. 
for the, ver the very final words, uh, I would say collaboration here is key to realize this vision that we are speaking about. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so we have still have one question here. I'm not sure if it's the same question, but maybe we can check uh, or I can stand, uh, extend for a few minutes so we can answer this question. I think Enrique has answered this question uh, partly uh, wrong. Same, okay. All right, so I'll mark that as answered. Okay, so I think um, that's all for today. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for this uh, very informative uh, and interesting presentation. Thank you guys for attending today's event. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you again in the future uh, web uh, webinar and an educational session. Um, in behalf of International Trade Council, I would like to thank uh, our uh, panelists and also I would like to thank our attendees for attending today's event. And thank you so much. And we we'll look forward to seeing you again in the next webinar. You both got uh, Thank you. Have a wonderful thank you. day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye-bye then. Bye. Bye.